Hey guys, it's Doc here. I just wanted to uh, get around to doing this video of what I picked up this week, but I wanted to say, I sat there and took the time to read the books a little more thoroughly than I have been in the last few weeks, and these are newer books, and somebody made the comment on a video, or actually on a Facebook post that I read the other day, and it, it said that they liked reading older books, but then the writing was trite, and it just didn't fit in with what your modern colloquialisms and speech patterns and things like that. So it was kind of like reading as an 85-year-old man that had only read, only read um, the classics. It would be like reading some of the Golden Age Superman books. It's a different time. Not that it's bad, but not that it's contemporary. On the other hand, I wanted to say the first book that I'm going to talk about today is Gotham by Gaslight, which is a facsimile edition written by Brian Augustine with art by Mike Manolia and P. Craig Russell. And let's go ahead and jump into this, and we'll talk about the other books that I picked up. All right, so this is a DC Elseworlds title. And this is a facsimile of the original book. Gotham by Gaslight introduces Batman versus Jack the Ripper. And what I wanted to say about this book is the fact that the writing is not decompressed. You get an entire tale in one book. You don't have to do a seven-part book, a six-part book. You don't have to make it stretch out and decompress it to the point where it's not any fun anymore. Instead, you can tell one story in what I believe is a 64-page prestige format book with wonderful art, with great storytelling that comes from that wonderful art, and... It needn't be longer and more drawn out than what you need in order to tell the story that you're trying to tell. I guess what I'm trying to say is it seems like a lot of things these days are written for trade. And it's nice to see, when I was reading this book, that you can tell an entire story in one sitting and you don't have to wait for six to eight to ten months for a story to play out. And a story that is masterfully told, a story that has great writing, it's got excellent pacing, and it's also got wonderful art that, again, you don't get to part five of seven and then you have to have a different inker come in or you have to have a different monthly artist finish up five, six, and seven because the artist that came on from one to four doesn't have time to finish the title anymore. It's nice to see that, and you don't see that in modern books. Like I said, you got Marco Cicchetto for the first, you know what, three issues of Ultimate Spider-Man that just got relaunched by Jonathan Hickman, and then you had David Messina, which nothing against David Messina for issues four and five, but you had a different artist within the first four issues, it breaks up the story. It breaks up the continuity of the tale. It breaks up so many aspects that you just don't think about if you've just now started reading comics. But if you've been reading comics as long as I have, I started with McFarlane's Torment in 1990, then you start to notice the nuances of the storytelling and how you tell a story using the visual cues given from the art, but also the cues that your imagination gets from reading the story when it's got depth, depth of character, depth of characterization, depth of plot, but you're not dragging it out for months on end. And that right there, this one book, taught me that, clear and concise. It need not be overly verbose. It need not be stretched out. Instead, just tell a damn good story. Tell it 
in one shot and then move on to something else. So think about that. And if you've never read this title, it's excellent. I'm glad that I spent the $4.99 to pick it up. And uh, I'm, I don't know that I'll be picking up the new Gotham by Gaslight, the Kryptonian Age miniseries, because it kind of defeats the purpose of what I was talking about. It's a six-issue mini. If you're going to do it properly and revisit this world, just do it in a two-parter or possibly a three-parter, like Dan Jurgens' excellent Batman the First Night just finished up. So, all right, well, that's all I'm going to say about that. So let me move on to the next book. And the next book is Green Lantern, issue 12, featuring Star Sapphire. This is written by Jeremy Adams with art by Zermanico. And this was another excellent, not one and done, but it's moving the plot forward. It's building upon something. This is almost as good as the Jeff Johns run. It's not as good as the Jeff Johns run, but it is almost, it's, it's world building. It's not villain of the month, villain of the week. It's, it's building upon a story that is going to have lasting repercussions for Hal Jordan. So the art in here by Zermanico, just like from the very beginning of the, uh, this particular run, this particular series, I can't say good enough stuff about it. It's just, I, I hope they keep him on here for a long time. But the story is that Hal goes to the United Planets and says, hey, you have a traitor in your midst. You have somebody who is taking over and trying to become a despo. And at the end of the last issue, it kind of backfired on him because apparently that person had already killed everybody else on the Council of the United Planets and replaced them with shapeshifter um, people of his own species. So... Now Hal is on the run with his fellow Green Lanterns, including Kyle Rayner, and trying to figure out exactly who he can trust and who he can't. At the same time, we get reintroduced to Carol Ferris as Star Sapphire, and they begin to build on a relationship that has been uh, denied them for the entirety of their time. So this is space opera. This is this type of stuff that back in the day caused people to pick up Amazing Spider-Man because, you know, not only is the spider an interesting character, but Peter Parker and his life and the characters that he interacts with. All right, moving on. The third book I picked up, and this is going to be polarizing for some people, but it's Ultimate X-Men Issue 4 by Peach Momoko as writer and artist. And... That's the thing about this. A lot of people don't like this run. A lot of people don't like what Momoko is doing with this. It's not really an X-Men title, if you think about it, because it's not people in colorful costumes going around and, uh, you know, kicking Apocalypse's tail back and forth. And it's a different take, a completely different take. And I don't know what this says about me, because I grew up, I grew up in the Jim Lee Chris Claremont era of X-Men. I'm loving the hell out of this. I'm enjoying this. I'm enjoying the artwork. I'm enjoying the title overall. And I heard Rock and Robbie on his um, video last night, and he said, I wish they would pick up the... You know what? Never mind. I wish they wouldn't pick up the pace. So I kind of feel the same way. I like the pace that this book is going, and it's honestly moving to the top of my pile. I'm enjoying the heck out of it every single month. And the story is really, really drawing me in. So I hope they keep doing what they're doing right now. All right, next up, I picked up Spider-Man, Shadow of a Green Goblin. You know, these untold tales fill in um, stories. I've kind of avoided the Venom books things like that. I've read that kind of stuff. I've read the stories from that era that I like. But this one here, Shadow of the Green Goblin, talking about the proto-goblin, Nails, and how he's kidnapped Harry Osborn, 
and and Harry Osborne's wife or Norman Osborne's wife is supposedly still alive at this time and pulling the strings for the proto goblin to try to to help heal him from his situation this is J.M. Dematis at his greatest. This is Dematis taking plot holes that nobody even ever thought about and spinning something truly amazing in it. The art by uh, Michael Maria is really, it fits the time of the series, which was right after Peter became Spider-Man. Uncle Ben had died. He's trying to learn the responsibility that comes with the power. So this is not a Peter who knows exactly what he's doing. This has got Gwen and Captain Stacy in it. It's got the, the characters that people like me that, that cherish the original run of Amazing Spider-Man. It has that character depth. If you've never read any Dematis' stuff, it's too easy for me to say, go out and check out Craven's Last Hunt. That's a no-brainer. That's a given. But go back and check out his and Sal Basima's run on Spectacular from, I believe it was 176 through issue 200. He stayed on for a few issues after that during the Maximum Carnage thing, and I, I can't uh, say how great that is again. That's one of my favorite miniseries. But, uh, well, series within a series, I guess we'll call it. But um, check this book out. It's three issues out of five, so you might want to wait for the trade unless you can go back and find the first two issues on a shelf somewhere. But uh, I, I cannot, cannot say enough good things about this title, and I kind of wish that they would bring Dematis back. Replace Zeb Wells with J.M. Dematis. Go back to one issue a month. I'm totally okay with it taking a little while for us to get to Amazing Spider-Man 1000 because I already know what they're going to do. They're going to do issue 1000 and then it'll go right back to the non-legacy numbering and to me that just kind of stinks because to have the book get to that level, you know, that high of a number is just crazy. But anyway, great stuff here. Absolutely amazing stuff. Transformers by Daniel Warren Johnson and Jorge Corona, the book of the week. We have a death in here of a character. We have Optimus Prime in mourning. We have Shockwave and Soundwave um, trying to build up the... Decepticon forces after the destruction of Starscream a couple issues back. This is the best book that I read this week. It just doesn't stop. It just keeps going faster and faster, and you think that it's going to stop, and you think that it's going to be, you know, hey, let's slow down and have a slow, quiet moment. You don't need a quiet moment. The way that Daniel Warren Johnson is writing this book is absolutely amazing. Jorge Corona has picked up the baton very, very admirably, where um, DWJ left off. So it would be really great to see these two team up for a long time. I'm not saying I don't want to see Daniel Warren Johnson come back as artist for the sec for the third, um, you know, set of stories. But if they can keep Jorge Corona on here, let him stay. You know, if he needs to fill in every once in a while, give him an issue off, but absolutely A-plus book. A-plus book. If you grew up in that time that I grew up, Transformers, G.I. Joe, that sort of thing was huge. This Energon universe, Robert Kirkman has done right by it by hiring the right people to do these titles. So if you're not reading Transformers, you're absolutely missing out. And the last book that I picked up this week is Something Epic by Simon Kodransky, and that's issue 11. This book gets better every single month. It's right up there, in my opinion, with Transformers. You still have the two characters, the duck detective, and you have Noah, the female detective, um, trying to find who killed Zeus. 
and what the motive behind the the death was. Um, somebody has stolen Zeus's lightning bolt. So in this issue, they go and they talk to Thor. Thor says, "You know, I, I've got I've got a building and a universe with five hundred and forty doors. That any happiness that I might not get from my wives can be provided here. I have a pleasure palace. Why do I need to leave?" Why would I ever need to leave? Why would I need to come to Earth? Why would I need to go to Olympus? Why would I need to go anywhere? So, this title just gets more epic as it goes along. I thought it was kind of uh, crass to call it something epic to begin with, but now that I've started reading it, and the artwork is mind-blowing. It is absolutely mind-blowing. The colors, the, the, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's just the storytelling that this man is doing with this book. I mean, look at that. Look at that. Look at that amazing artwork and the colors. So, not the biggest week that I've ever had, guys, but some of the best comics that I have read in a long time. It has really reinvigorated me with this to do these videos, to talk about these things that I love and that I enjoy. So hopefully you guys and gals are enjoying these videos. We've kind of stalled at the subscriber mark. So if you have friends that read comics that are not watching these videos, please let them know. Let them know to come and check out the channel. I want to keep growing. I want this thing to just do gangbusters because I love talking about comics. Um, I, I didn't know him, or nor did I follow the channel, but in closing, I would like to give my condolences to Comic Storian's wife and family for his passing this week. Um, everything that I've seen on the internet and everything I've seen on YouTube shows that he was genuinely a stand-up guy who had a lot of love and passion for comics, for his family, and for his you know, loved ones. So condolences in this time of grieving. You guys go out there and read a comic and dig into it in his honor and in his memory. Thank you guys for your time. Thanks for watching. Have a great time tonight and for the rest of this week. And if you haven't yet, like and subscribe, and we'll see you in the next video.